Kalimera, and thank you for being with us uh, today. Uh, I'm Chrysos Kavunidis. I head up BCG's uh, office in Athens. Uh, it's great to be back in Delphi in person, and I'm honored to have on the panel with me today Mr. Christos Dimas, Deputy Minister for Research and Innovation. Uh, we have Andreas Athanasopoulos, Deputy CEO of Eurobank, Alexandros Paterakis, Deputy CEO of uh, VEI, and uh, Francois Candelon, uh, the Global Director of BCG's Henderson Institute. Together, we will be discussing today how to unleash the power of corporate innovation. We've discussed uh, innovation a lot over the last couple of days uh, at the forum, and the reason behind that is that companies are looking at innovation as a lever for growth. As in mature economies, it has become harder to differentiate as client expectations are becoming uh, more sophisticated, as value chains are being disrupted. Innovation has become critical for companies to remain relevant. However, uh, large organizations do not have a great track record uh, in innovation. And our experience and research tells us that they fail along four key failure modes, as we call them. The first we refer to as the ivory tower. It's where companies are extremely well at generating ideas centrally and creating innovation centrally, but it never really materializes into something impactful uh, in, in the front line for the business because it's too distant from the real needs of the business. It's too distant from the real needs of the customer. The second is what we refer to as grassroots chaos. It's where we have an organization that creates lots of great ideas at the front end on how to address client uh, needs and produce new products and services, new ideas on how to do things, but they never are able to scale up and have real business impact because they're not focused in a strategic way with a specific objective and organizations are not really putting the resources and the emphasis behind them to help them scale uh, and materialize. A third failure mode we call the cute app. It's the syndrome where we create really fancy products and services, ideas, with really cool functionality, but there isn't really the business need. The customer doesn't really want it or, or need it. And finally, what we refer to as killing me softly. It's where we have an organization that has a real entrepreneurial spirit across it. It really generates great ideas, a lot of people proactively trying to push them, but they never really materialize into business impact because people get fed up and give up because of all the obstacles uh, they, they encounter from the corporate culture in delivering innovation. So with these things in mind, we really want to discuss today uh, with our panel, how do we really let corporates innovate, create innovation in corporates? Uh, and if I may, Andrea, I'll start with you. Your bank's recent branding talks a lot about pioneers. So clearly the bank believes in the concept of innovation in its widest possible sense. But can it really be, can large organizations really innovate and does it need to be driven centrally or from the front line? What's your experience on this? First of all, thank you. And thank you all for, the, for your attendance today. For me, innovation, first of all, personally, it will be a big success to, to be able to, to respond in just five minutes. For me, it's a mega innovation. Um, the, now going back to your question, I will try to answer with, um, let's say, three different pillars that constitute a story. For large organizations like, and indeed a bank, more or less people have pre-decided that we are, we are dead insofar as innovation is concerned, and uh, we talk only about regulation and uh, how we're gonna make life difficult for ourselves and for clients. Is it like that? Uh, personally, I don't think so. I think, um, first of all, we need to, uh, to, to agree what it is and what it isn't innovation. And there's so much literature talking about the definitions, and that's not the point today. But as far as I'm concerned, anything that um, um, makes things different to what it is currently done 
can be turned under innovation. It can be uh, uh, gradual innovation, it can be um, uh, de novo innovation. You can, you can scale up what innovation is the way you want. But uh, for, for, for me and for us, uh, first of all, the, the big dimension of innovation relates to being able to do things differently and sometimes in a de novo way. But what the banks do differently? Many people think digital and digital transformation. It's not. This is not innovation. Digital is part of an innovation journey, but it's a very low expectation to think that digital is innovation. There are mega things happening in the financial service industry today that constitute innovation. For instance, the last five, six years, the banking system changed the way it's managing the non-performing assets, otherwise it would have just shut down itself, in an innovative way. And, and the, the people of Eurobank were very fortunate to lead this innovation that it was then adopted by the whole banking system. So this is a mega scale innovation. We don't talk too much about that because we think it's, it's done now. A second mega innovation, I would dare to say, is that all the banking system talks about digital. Banks must become digital. We as a bank stood up and we said, no, we want to be digital. And we also say bank branches are back and stores are back. And if you read IMF studies recently, in the post-COVID era, the role of the store is coming back. So saying no digital but digital is a big statement. And for us, it is an innovation. So from, from that point of view, what I want you to, 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 to carry with you today is that innovation is to make big things in a different way. A second dimension is to democratize innovation. Innovation is not for a small people of, uh, let's say, with long hair and big beer and that they eat a lot of um, um, junky food and they come up with ideas. It's not that. You need to democratize innovation. Democratizing innovation, for instance, it means to, to build communities of analytics within organization whereby analytics is not the, the, the ownership of a small team, but the whole organization. So, yes, you can democratize innovation. You can invite employees to bring ideas forward to challenge. That's why in our bank we call it challenger box, whereby employees challenge us on how to change the bank. Finally, innovation is all about networking. In the banking uh, organizations nowadays, there is this hypothetical um, dilemma between incumbent banks and fintechs. This is the wrong dilemma. There is no dilemma, as a matter of fact. The, everybody now talks about symbiosis, but we need to find a way how to be symbiotic with fintechs. So, innovation is big things and big decisions going against the norm. Second is to democratize, democratize it within large organizations. Third, build networks. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, Alexander, you, you, you lead the digital transformation in, in, a, in an industry that is very traditional, but on the other hand is, as we stand at the moment, at the cutting edge in many ways of innovation. Uh, you also have a, a long history of working in startups, so you, you've seen both sides of the coin. How do you see the, the roadblocks that large organizations face vis-a-vis -vis the startups uh, that you've worked with in the past, and, and how do these two things bridge each other? So, first of all, welcome to all. Thank you for being here. Um, I've worked in many regions and with various corporations. Uh, we've talked and talked time and time and again about innovation. Innovation is very hard. It's very, very difficult. It requires a, a lot of effort. It requires perseverance. And it requires people to try and fail and try and fail consistently until you get it right. It's not an easy task. You can't just pick it off a book and apply it in your day-to-day -day job. It requires a lot of work from a lot of people across a lot of parts of the organization. So I second what Andrea said. It's a holistic thing. It's not just a one title item. But this brings me, obviously, to sort of the second challenge you face. When somebody has a large organization, in this case, uh, the PPC Group, 
our day-to-day -day jobs are, in current circumstances, ultimately challenged. We have a lot of things to do every day, and it's super hard, and in certain cases, it feels impossible to focus on innovation. It's very hard to take time and resources off your day-to-day -day and put them on a task called innovation. Definitely, innovation has to be part of our day-to-day -day job. So what is it that we have to do? We have to, as leaders of, of an organization, manage that balance. We need to create the right environment. We need to provide the right insight and the right directional input so that we consistently push the organization, remove barriers, remove fear elements, and in certain cases, allow them to fail. I think a very simple, practical example I've done in a couple of my previous jobs is I instigated what you call the get out of jail card. The get out of jail card, which is very valuable also where I am today in PPC, allows people to fail. They can go off and do something. They'll come back and say, I failed. Well, he's got that card. Nothing happens to his job. Nothing happens to his performance. He can continue doing something else. Building DNA of innovation at the core of an organization is something that every single executive in a corporation should be working to deliver. It's mandatory, and I believe in, in a number of years, it will be ultimately one of the things that if you don't do, you will face an existential crisis. It's very, very difficult. But again, as, as an organization, we're not only having to look inwards. It's not about what we will innovate. Innovation is not necessarily done only for us as a corporation. We have responsibilities outside of our company. We are one of the largest companies in Greece. So for us, it's equally important to allow innovation to facilitate itself around us. So a number of things that we'll be doing in the forthcoming months and announcement will be made is we'll be working to build an ecosystem where we will play a duality of roles. One is that of a sandbox. Somebody's got an idea, somebody has a business, somebody has a product, they'd like to try it. We'll be a real life guinea pig. They can come up to us and actually trial them. And through them, we'll actually learn again. They will probably do a lot of the work, but we will be forced to work in that innovative form. The second is we'll be looking at some of these companies in the extended energy space, energy services space. And we'll be targeting for them to work with us, or we'll be targeting for them to grow. And the final point for us is working to educate, working to allow, whether it's academic, institutional, professional companies, businesses, to work with us, so that a lot of these elements that we're faced is in terms of challenges or benefits coming out of this innovation, we can co-author, co-work. So we'll be trying to build the right caliber of future executives coming from within our company and, and, and outside to work and understand how to balance that challenge between sort of running your day-to-day -day business and making sure you don't take your eye off the innovation scale. Thank you very much. Thank you. Francois, you've, you've looked at this many times and you've done a lot of uh, research into this. You've worked with many clients. First question is, do these themes that you're hearing resonate? Uh, and the second is, we heard now from Alexander the concept of ecosystems and partnering. It's something we've heard a lot around the innovation topic uh, more widely, but also at the forum uh, this year. What makes a success of these ecosystems and partnerships and how do they bridge that gap between the structural problems and uh, yeah. innovation. No, and, and of course, what was said absolutely resonates, and uh, you are perfectly right when you, when you say that it's not possible to uh, learn something just from the book. But I would say there are some good practices, and I think that um, in the world in general, in Europe in particular, we don't pay, uh, let's say we don't make the right level of um, effort there. For instance, um, you need to bring your best talents on, uh, on innovation. And what we see is that many companies just pay lip service to innovation. 60% of the companies in Europe don't make innovation a C-suite role. So how do you want to get your best talents? Second thing, you, you need massive willpower. Can you imagine the Satya Nadella's willpower to move from an old product-centric business model to a SaaS model? Are we ready to do it? And the third thing is that you need to choose your area for excellence. You cannot be Apple 
Amazon, PNG, and Zara at the same time. So you need to see whether it's more about creativity, if it's more about customer obsession, it's, it's because you become the process guru. So you need to make choices. But um, I, I have some empathy with the traditional companies because uh, over the last 20 years, most of the innovation was coming from digital. And in digital, especially at the beginning, the uh, barrier to entry, the barriers to scale were limited. And therefore, it was not playing with uh, our capabilities in traditional companies. So I, I think this is one thing. But the next wave of disruption, which will be done by deep tech, is maybe more favorable. Deep tech, why? Because deep tech is a combination of digital and physical technological breakthroughs. And because of that, the barriers to entry, the barriers to scale are much higher. For instance, if you do a biotech uh, prototype, it costs you 10 times more than if you do a, um, a blockchain prototype. Uh, out of the 1,200 uh, syn synthetic biology um, uh, venture that were funded as of uh, since 2015, just 5% were able to scale. And therefore, traditional companies where they ability to industrialize processes and so on are in a better position. And this is what we see. For instance, Pfizer and BioNTech for the vaccine, but we have Nike and Flex on 3D printed shoes. We have Bayer and uh, Ginkgo uh, through the, uh, for the fertilizers through microbes. So I, I think that this is why the notion of ecosystems the, or the notion of alliances, I have here my friend Michael Jacobides, so when I use the word ecosystem, I'm very careful. Um, but I think that there is a last point I would like to make, and it's, it's more for you. It's about the, the role of governments, because innovation is very important for traditional companies, but not only for companies. Uh, Michael Porter used to say that uh, the competitiveness of a nation depends on the capacity of its industry to innovate and upgrade. And in our countries in Europe, with our labor laws, our social models, and so on, the ability to upgrade traditional companies is mandatory. And if we want to make it happen, we, there, the governments have a critical role, and a role that is not just limited to regulation or to uh, subsidies, but the role to become the catalyst, to become uh, the a trusted third party for these ecosystems to emerge, and we have plenty of examples. Examples in China, where I've been living uh, for, uh, let's say, uh, for, for, uh, for seven years up to the COVID crisis, but examples in Europe as well. Look, for instance, at Innovalux in uh, Luxembourg, which is what we would call a public-private ecosystem for innovation. You have the same things in Finland. So I think it's very important for us in Europe to realize that and to become the, the, the country where not only we innovate, but where we upgrade. Thank you, Francois. Um, Minister, we've, we've, we've seen a lot of uh, acceleration, particularly on, on the startup ecosystem side in, in Greece and a lot of development over the last years. In order to get to what, what we just heard being described, which is clusters, ecosystems, uh, private-public partnerships, partnerships between corporates and research, educational institutions, startups, um, we need the right frameworks in terms of legislation, IP, in terms of taxation incentives, and we've seen a lot of that evolve. Could you share with us a little bit how you think um, we've progressed over the last couple of years and what we can expect in the future going forward to help accelerate this uh, collaboration? Okay. Thank you very much, Jorise. Uh, Allow me to state that uh, up until recently, the Greek state did not know how many startups we had, in which sector they were, how many people they employed, what budgets they had. We had absolutely no information about the startup ecosystem. Uh, when you don't have data, it is very difficult to implement successful policies or effective policies. So the, the first question, though, that we, we dealt with is how you actually define uh, a startup. How, how do you differentiate between a, a newly formed company and, and a startup? 
So we, we used our scientific community, uh, the National Council for uh, uh, Science, Research, uh, Technology and Innovation. We came up with, uh, with a definition of a, of, a, of a startup which has to do with a, a strong evaluation process. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, companies have to uh, have some form of innovation either in their products, service or processes which they bring uh, up front and they must also have the uh, ability to, uh, to scale up. Uh, so after after defining uh, uh, the the startups, uh, we had to see how we can actually uh, know uh, uh, our customers, our, our startups, to whom we we actually are uh, planning to implement policies. So we created the startup registry, Elevate Greece. Uh, it has been working as a platform in the last one and a half year. Uh, through Elevate Greece, uh, the Greek state for the first time uh, actually legislated uh, tax incentives for angel investors, uh, for stock options. Um, we even uh, ran a very successful uh, um, program in order to increase the liquidity of the startup ecosystem of the startups due to the effects of the pandemic crisis, giving up to 100,000 euros uh, per startup. Uh, when other countries uh, and perhaps more developed ecosystems gave 1,000 euros uh, or even nothing to their, to their startups. Uh, but we also built, uh, because it's not only, the, the startup ecosystem does not only need tools from the public sector, but also from the private sector. So we created a very important uh, group of official partners of Elevate Greece, uh, including Eurobank, uh, uh, all of the banks actually of, uh, of Greece, uh, multinational companies and each official partner is providing Elevate Greece, the startup ecosystem, with very specific tools that might have to do with specified banking products, uh, free cloud services, uh, access to global innovation networks they, they may have, uh, mentoring uh, and, and whatever else you can, you can actually think. Uh, we, due to the success of Elevate Greece, we actually voted 10 days ago that Elevate Greece from a digital platform uh, will become a, a company of the public sector because our goal is to see how we can actually increase the extroversity of our ecosystem and it's necessary to have, to have a company. Now, the ecosystem though does not only include the startups, it also includes academic institutions for example. Uh, we recently changed all of the legal framework uh, of uh, how spin-off companies within uh, research centers and universities operate. We simplified the procedure for academics to create uh, even if they need to, to operate and even if they need to shut down uh, their, their spin-off companies. Uh, we have uh, also created important tools uh, for, for companies that invest in R&D. We actually increased uh, super deduction uh, tax rates for companies that invest in R&D from 130% to 200%, providing one of the most competitive frameworks uh, for companies uh, that invest in R&D. We are proceeding with uh, important uh, uh, funding uh, uh, projects for the creation of innovation clusters. We have actually proceeded. We are now completing the, uh, the process for uh, competence uh, centers. Uh, for technology transfer offices, so we are, see, we are trying to see how we can link research and innovation much more effectively with entrepreneurship. Uh, we are making good use of the RRF funds, uh, we are increasing the, inf we are uh, upgrading the infrastructure of, uh, of uh, all of the infrastructure of all of our research centers throughout the country, trying to give more tools uh, for our academic community. Uh, uh, and uh, our goal is to see how we can make uh, our, uh, our, our companies that are innovative uh, to feel 100% sure that they can be competitive at a global scale from Greece. That is our, our main initiative. Finally, we are also creating a, an innovation district uh, in, uh, in Attica, in Hropi, an innovation district is a place where you actually have uh, startup spin-offs, uh, companies that invest in R&D trying to, trying to create synergies between them uh, and matchmaking events, uh, having as an ultimate goal the creation of synergies uh, and innovative products and, and services. This is one of our flagship uh, actions. We have uh, also a similar project in uh, Thessaloniki, the uh, Thessintech. Uh, so we want to create all of the necessary environment in order to 
uh, unlock, uh, unleash uh, the, uh, the uh, corporate uh, uh, innovation opportunities and academic opportunities that the Greek talented scientists and entrepreneurs have. Uh, we know that we, we should have took action many years ago as a country. Uh, I want to be clear on that. Uh, but because we know that countries that do not make the necessary moves now uh, will uh, uh, the, the, the global community runs so fast that you have to adapt to its needs. If we don't take decisive steps and run two or three times quicker than our competitive, uh, competitors, we will remain back. So it's absolutely necessary uh, to, to put all of this emphasis and we are trying to run uh, quicker than our competitors. Thank you. Alexander, Andrea, uh, uh, some final points from yourselves. Do you feel that uh, through partnerships, through such uh, ventures and the ecosystem, is, is it maturing and do you feel that this is something that will make Greek corporates more competitive generally, but also on the innovation front and, and actually close what we often see as the, the scale disadvantage that Greek businesses often have? I think, I think there are two challenges here. One is uh, the Greek corporates are not big enough. Although they are big enough for the Greek standards, they are not big enough. So they, they need to be fueled by the enthusiasm and the spirit of entrepreneurship from networks and uh, partnerships. The second is, which is a prerequisite, is the Greek, the Greek corporates are big enough to be bureaucratic enough and to stop innovation from within. So, so we need the external stimuli in order not only to become bigger and faster, but at the same time to m mobilize the internal capabilities of the organizations to move towards a more uh, innovative spirit. And that's why our DNA that we have um, uh, concluded to is that we need to support pioneers as an organization from within and from outside. So yes. We need that for different reasons. I wouldn't have given the same answer had I been in the US, I must say. Thank you. Yeah. Clearly, uh, we do have all of the ingredients. The frameworks are now in place. I think clearly, from the minister's perspective, he just clarified everything. I think the corporates have now actually understood, especially in Greece, the need for innovation. They're making all the relevant decisions. Investment is there, which is another pillar. I think that also will play a significant role. And we are, I think, global enough at this point in time. Europe has actually a pan-European process for stimulating uh, innovation throughout the continent and, again, increasing competitiveness. I feel, looking at it, we have in front of us exciting times. I think they're going to be great opportunities. I believe we are going to see a lot more unicorns than the few that we've seen so far. I would invite every single person out there who has an idea, has a vision, reach out to any of the elements of the framework that we discussed. I think it's going to be a very, very good decade for innovation and new startups in the country. Thank you very much. So to summarize, what I'm hearing is we have all the ingredients. Uh, we need to focus it centrally and make sure that we are enabling and driving innovation within our organizations and embedding it in our DNA. We need to democratize it, so we need to let the whole organization innovate. And we shouldn't do it alone. We need to leverage the capabilities out there. Uh, we need to leverage the entrepreneurship out there and also let that entrepreneurship influence us and the way we work uh, as larger organizations. Maybe I would like to add one thing, is that I'm extremely optimistic about Greece. This is why I'm here, because I think you have everything in terms of the talents, in terms of the locations and so on, to become the Silicon Valley of Europe to a certain extent. So I encourage you to be very open, not just for the Greek talents, but for the European and the global talents. So uh, with this energy, I'm sure you will make it. Can, can I make a quick, <clears throat> a quick statement as well? Um, I'm very happy all of us share this optimism. I'm very optimistic as well for the Greek innovation ecosystem. Uh, I really have a lot of faith in the, the Greek startup spin-offs in the academic community, uh, which I think has made a lot of steps in the last, last years. Uh, and uh, I, I want to say that I, if I have to make a forecast, uh, I really believe that we have uh, a lot of potential uh, to unleash 
uh, this potential. We're working to unleash this potential. And uh, I would dare to say that we will have a lot of unicorns in the near future. Uh, and our goal is to make Greece uh, the main research and innovation hub of Southeastern Europe. So attracting talented people from the wider neighborhood is one of our strategic priorities. Gentlemen, thank you very much for all your insights and for closing on time. Thank you all for attending. Very professional. Make game of this.